This passage of scripture is John's account of the last meal that Jesus and his disciples would share together. It marks the ending of their ministry together, of their sharing conversation, meals, Jesus' teaching and their learning, and especially their friendship. Jesus has been preparing them for this last moment together. And either they have been unable to understand what Jesus was doing, or they are living in denial. I suspect it is both. But as I read this story, Jesus does not want it to be an ending for them. He wants them to continue his ministry. And I believe it is what he has been preparing them to do the whole time he was with them. So here, as they recline around the table, Jesus makes one last attempt to ensure that they get the message he has been sharing with them throughout his ministry. He does it, as he has often done it, by turning tradition, expectation, social custom upside down. Jesus has always been ready to go against the way things are supposed to be, and he has never been bound by, well, it's the way we've always done it. Jesus looks around the table at the disciples, and he decides to take drastic action to portray in a dramatic fashion what he expects them to do after he is gone. He gets up from the table, he takes off his outer robe, Basically, he strips down to a loincloth, and then he wraps a towel around himself. He fills a basin with water and begins to wash the disciples' feet one by one. In doing so, he assumes the role of a lowly servant. Only a lowly servant or slave will wash the feet of the master or the master's guests it would be absolutely unheard of for a rabbi such as Jesus or a master to do such a thing. He proceeds from one disciple to another. They must have been shocked, speechless, to see this happening because no one objects until, until Jesus gets to guess who. Yes, Peter, good old Peter the one who has provided Jesus with so many teachable moments. Peter is not speechless. He is clearly appalled that Jesus, his teacher and master, would perform such a lowly act. He said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now I'm sure that knowing what we know about Peter, it didn't come out of his mouth like that as a simple question. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <coughs> Never one to hide his feelings, Peter likely said it something like this, Oh, yes, boy, you're going to wash my feet? Oh, Peter, Jesus replies, you just don't get it, do you? Later on, you'll understand. But Peter is not pacified. You will never wash my feet. Jesus must have been just about fed up with Peter's dramatics. And he answers him, well, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. When I read Jesus' answer, I can't help but hear it sound something like this. Peter, unless you let me get on with this, you're kicked out of the club. You're no longer one of my disciples. Now that finally breaks through to Peter. It breaks through his resistance. But of course, Peter being Peter, goes over the top with his response. Lord, not only my feet, but my head and my hands as well. When Jesus has finished washing all the disciples' feet, he sits down, and as a good teacher, he wants to make sure that they have understood what he has just tried to teach them by his act. 
Do you know what I have done for you? Do you understand <clears throat> my object lesson? Do you get it? And just to make sure that they do understand, he tells them in plain language, For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. And then he adds, If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Understanding what Jesus wants of the disciples, or of us, is only the first step of discipleship. The story is told of a baseball game. <coughs> One of the players is coming up to bat. And there's a runner on first, and they need to get that runner over to second base. And so when the player gets to home plate, he looks down the third baseline to the coach. And the coach flashes those cryptic signals that he does with all of those hand signals. And the sign is for him to lay down a sacrificial bunt. Lay down a bunt. He then promptly proceeds to take three huge swings at the ball, misses every time and strikes out. The coach meets him on his way back to the dugout. Didn't you see me give you the sign to lay down a sacrifice bunt? Yes, the player replied, but I didn't really think you meant it. As the cross was to reveal, Jesus is very definitely signaling that self-sacrifice in the service of others is to be the mark of the Christian. It is in doing what Jesus wants that we open ourselves to receive the full measure of his blessings. Now, of course, Jesus isn't just talking about the disciples or us going about washing everybody's feet, just as he has done. No, Jesus is talking about something bigger. Jesus is talking about a way of life, a way of living that is marked by service to others. And to make that point extra clear, Jesus adds, I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Love others just as much as I have loved you. I can't help but wonder if having just witnessed Jesus' dramatic act of service, if one or another of the disciples didn't look at the one sitting next to him and whisper, really? That much? Do you really think he means it? And then they hear, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Ah yes, he means it. Our actions reveal who we are. A little boy by the name of Billy was visiting his grandmother in California. And one summer while he was visiting her, he almost wore her out with his vigorous activity. He would come and go and he was never still and Grandma was exhausted. She was accustomed to living a very peaceful and orderly life. He was perpetual motion, into everything, and nearly turned the house upside down every day. One night, when they were both sound asleep, there was an earthquake. The grandmother was awakened by the house shaking, and in, in her concern for Billy, shouted out, Billy! Billy! Billy yelled back, I didn't do it, Grandma! <laughs> well, Billy was like a little earthquake, and at times his grandmother didn't quite know what to do when she was taken out of her quiet lifestyle. We reveal who we are by our actions. It is by our interactions with others that we paint stroke by stroke the portrait of who we are. I don't know how many of you are fans of MASH, you know, the old sitcom set in the Korean War. I think it's my favorite program of all time. And I remember one episode if you're a fan, you'll probably remember it as well. 
Rizzo, the mechanic, who has a little baby called Bubba. Rizzo has a fake grenade, and he wants to play a prank with it. And Charles Emerson Winchester III was the one he chose to trick. Now, Charles was a pompous, arrogant surgeon who looked down on everyone else, especially the servants, which included all those of lesser rank. He saw them as servants there to provide for his comfort, the comfort he thought he deserved. And of course, that certainly included the lowly mechanics, like Rizzo. Now Rizzo comes to Charles' tent, the swamp, and on some pretext or another, he gets, and he gets allowed in. And while there, he shows Charles the grenade. And of course, in the process, manages to pull out the pin and drop the grenade. Charles, thinking it's a real grenade, and about to explode, throws himself on top of the grenade and shouts for Rizzo to run and save himself. When the grenade does not explode, Charles gets up with a sigh of relief, says, it must have been a dud. Now Rizzo is speechless, except for some hums and ahs and a yeah. He has a very funny look on his face as he looks at Charles. Rizzo has a new understanding of what kind of person Charles really is under all that pomposity and arrogance. You can almost hear Rizzo thinking, really, that much? He cares that much that he would throw himself on a grenade that he thought to be real. Of course, that wasn't real life, but there are many historical accounts <coughs> of soldiers during various wars throwing themselves on live grenades or in other ways, sacrificing their lives to save their comrades in arms. Putting one's life on the line for another human being is not confined to wartime. Love one another as I have loved you, was Jesus' new commandment. As I have loved you is the key phrase. And if referring to love uh, as a command is a problem, it's most likely due to us thinking of love as a feeling. However, if love is the way God acts toward the world, and if the love is the way Jesus acts toward his disciples, then love means telling the truth, being faithful to one's witness, caring compassionately for others, and living out that compassion, even to the point of death. Sociologist Robert Wuthnow of Princeton University has studied human behavior. Many people, he found, perform deeds of compassion, service, and mercy because at some point in their lives, someone acted with compassion toward them. He wrote, the caring we receive may touch us so deeply that we feel especially gratified when we're able to pass it on to someone else. And he tells the story of, John, of Jack Casey as an example. When Jack was a small child, he had to have oral surgery. Five teeth had to be pulled out, and it was going to be under general anesthetic. And Jack was fearful. As a young child, he really didn't know what was going on. But what he remembers most about that experience was the operating room nurse who, sensing the boy's terror, said, don't worry, I'll be right here beside you no matter what happens. When Jack woke up after the surgery, there she was, true to her word, standing right beside him. Nearly 20 years later, Jack had become a paramedic on an ambulance rescue squad. One day, Jack's ambulance was called to the scene of a highway accident. A truck had overturned. The driver was pinned in the cab, and power tools would be necessary to free him. However, gasoline was leaking, 
and dripping on to the driver one spark from the metal tool hitting metal would have spelled disaster the driver was terrified crying out that he was scared of dying so Jack crawled right into the cab beside him and said look don't worry I'm right here with you I'm not going anywhere and Jack was true to his word he stayed with the man until he was safely removed from the wreckage later the trucker told Jack you were an idiot you know that whole thing could have exploded and we both had been burned up Jack told him that he felt he just couldn't leave many years before Jack had been treated compassionately by the nurse and because of that experience he could now show that same compassion to another receiving grace enabled him to give grace even to the point of putting his life on the line for another later on John writes in chapter 15 verse 13 no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends really that much Jesus is of course the prime example of that kind of love to us as Christians his love for the people around him and those with whom he came in contact during his ministry is a major focus of the Gospels he was willing to set aside religious and social tradition even the law to help someone in need he did that over and over again throughout his ministry but doing that was a threat to the religious and social systems of the time the priests Pharisees and other authorities relied on those systems to give them their position and prominence and control over the people and so they saw him as a threat not only to the system but to their very livelihood Jesus was such a threat that eventually as we are re remembering during this Holy Week they went into action and managed to get him arrested and then crucified so in later days months and years when the disciples remember the foot washing they realize that when he says love one another as I have loved you he's referring to his coming death and I have no doubt that they said really that much do we need to look for ways to sacrifice our own lives to prove that we're living up to Jesus command to love one another as much as he loves us no we don't need to go and look for ways to sacrifice our lives or put our lives on the line but the story of Jack Casey and the nurse of his childhood shows us that even little acts of love and compassion compassion and service can have an impact far beyond our expectations one more point I need to make before I'm finished and I do mean point because it pokes us and it prods us it shows us how difficult loving as Jesus did really is if we believe we have a valid excuse for not loving a particular person someone who has treated us badly or just someone we really do not like then we need to take another closer look at the passage from John I read earlier we need to consider the context in which Jesus tells the disciples and us to love one another in this passage just before he gives them the new command to love Jesus tells them that one of them will betray him but they do not know who the betrayer will be verse 30 tells us that the betrayer has departed but the disciples don't yet understand who that person is going to be so in spite of the fact that they do not know who the betrayer will be do not know who the one among them they cannot trust Jesus commands them to love one another anyway reminding us to act with love to everyone even those we do not like or do not trust but as with all commandments this one ultimately requires us to throw ourselves on the mercy of God's love 
to rely on God's grace rather than our compliance with the law. Most of us fail daily to act in loving ways, even towards our loved ones, and even more so toward people who rub us the long way. And so we pray for grace, grace to keep the commandment, and especially for grace when we fail. And the good news? The good news is that God loves us anyway. Yes, really, that much. Amen.